Good morning, uh, Lucia Van Hayden. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, you're our first South Africa interviewee. Um, a pleasure. I mean, Aaron Lamprey, always a pleasure to see you. Can you tell me about you know um, what you do, who you are, and what's the Ozor um, Ambassador uh, company that you that you work for? I am a, um, um, for work, I am an international school nurse, a registered school nurse. I am a motivational speaker and I do life coaching as well for pre and post amputation. And then I'm a South African amputee ambassador for OSA. OSA is one of the, um, I am prejudiced, one of the best um, prosthetic companies that is our biggest Headquarters is based in Iceland, and um, we make all kinds of prosthesis that enables amputees and all other prosthesis that enables people to be more adaptable and to live life, to live life to the fullest, and we live, we we believe in life without limitations. Fantastic. I mean, you know, um, you you're down as a ballerina. Um, you know, you come from dance and, you know, you talk about, obviously, you, you lost um, a limb uh, through medical, medical negligence and, you know, the life you the struggled and the change of life. What's, I mean, you know, tell me about your story. What, how, how did it all begin for you and how things changed? Um, I had a, I have a small procedure on my leg which went very wrong and a doctor decided to put an external fixator on after the leg became a non-union. And when I woke up, I had a massive external fixator on my leg, and which I didn't give consent for. And they also fractured my ankle on a non-union leg that didn't want to heal just below my knee. And six months later, I had infection, salmonella infection in the bone, which destroyed almost 10 centimeters of bone and it was just it just went downhill from there fins started breaking i had septicemia i went into septic shock three times um and i i refused i really refused for seven years to amputate it was my biggest fear to become disabled my biggest biggest fear I refused to amputate. I actually had a contract with my medical doctors not to amputate that I would rather die than to become disabled and to become an amputee. So okay. it was a drastic thing for me. And basically I am now living that massive fear that really controlled and was such a big obsession for me for seven years. And my life actually turned out pretty wonderful. It, it was actually a small blessing. I think I became, I became a whole person after an amputation. It, I became a whole person, a very deep whole person. So my acceptance of self and the, the real defining of accepting myself and who I am and making peace of my life became a much deeper meaning for me. So I think my life really turned out very positive. It's not easy. It's definitely not easy. I mean, it's, it's a massive adaptive. Everything you do needs to be adapted. But for me as a person, it really turned my life, I think, 180 degrees in a deeper, more meaningful way. Fantastic. I mean, it, you know, as I say, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, we talk about disability and inclusion and, you know, what's it like for you to, you know, I mean, how do you inspire yourself and keep yourself motivated? Um, talking about inclusion. Well, talking about how, how do you, you know, how do you keep yourself motivated and inspired during your, during your day, during, during lockdown? I mean, what inspires you? I think it's a journey it's 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 a daily journey I mean for me in the beginning it was massive just I mean to be honest with you 
just to wear a prosthesis was huge. I couldn't even walk in front of a mirror just wearing a pin leg because my brain couldn't understand that I could trust a leg to walk on. And so it was really a journey. And I, and I called my journey from the beginning getting out of my amputee closet because I was a secret amputee for quite a while. And um, getting out of my closet, it, it was such a journey from where I accepted myself and being an amputee from, and small things, seeing small miracles every day, um, um, being able to carry my own cup of coffee, being able to start living on my own, starting to work as a nurse again. Um, everything was grace. Every day was really just blessings and grace for me. Um, and you need to start noticing small things. And I really can see everything was just grace. And what keeps me motivated is I think you should have the ability or just keep on reminding yourself of all the positive things that you see every day. And I, I keep a, I keep, I like to keep like a journal, a, a blessings journal, even if you are down and under, just to write down something positive five days, even if it's really when you're depressed and down, if you are able to write down five things every day, I think I learned that from Oprah. <laughs> if you can write down five positive things every day, just to be thankful for, and to remind you to be thankful for, and, just to keep on being inquisitive about life and being open-minded to be adaptive to any changes in your life. Because everything changes every day. You need to be able to step out of your comfort zone and adapt to new things. Because ne ne nothing positive really, or nothing big or beautiful is ever gonna happen in a comfort zone. So you need to step out and grow. And that's never com that's never comfortable. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's it's and it's all really just grace and blessings. Fantastic. I'm gonna hand over to Owen now. Owen, Owen's got a few questions for you, if that's okay. Um so Owen, over to you. Hi, thanks. Great to meet you again. Um yeah. and um you've talked about your role as an OSO ambassador. Um how has that changed your life? And how does it continue to impact on your health and well-being as well as the positive impact that you have on others? I think being, being, um, being part of the OSA group has probably been one of the greatest, greatest blessings and achievements for me. Or it, it's, it's such a, it's, it's such a, it's, it's so amazing being surrounded by such a group of positive people. And the amazing thing is learning how technology actually changes every day. And like I say again, how you can really learn how to adapt to things. There is so many possibilities if you are open to it. And just being surrounded by these people is amazing. And learning from each other and learning just small things how to take a shower how you know easier way how to get off stairs and being able to share that with other people and just spreading that positive vibe and energy and also just being part of a group um being people like you and going through the same obstacles than you and having the same down and ups like you is already a positive experience fantastic um you've talked a little bit about this already but it really seems like you've almost had a, a transformational change between your attitude towards um amputation and then post amputation can you explain a little bit more about the health and well-being change that that really inspired you at that time and and continues to inspire you now Owen, can you just can you just re repeat that? Sorry, I'm I'm just interested in your change of mindset before amputation and afterwards because it seems to be so transformational that you were so much against it beforehand, and it's had therefore such a positive impact 
on your life. I just wondered how that came about. Was it small steps at first or um, just the sheer impact of the um, prosthetics ha had on your life? What, what was it? Prosthetics makes a big difference. Um, it, like I said, it, it enables you to do things that you really thought was impossible. It, especially if, if it's made properly and if it suits you properly and it becomes part of you. And, but first of all, you need to go into that part of you of accepting. And I once read a part where it says that, where it says that you are enough. And I read a part, I can't remember who the author or the, the person who wrote this quote was, who said that everything, everything is up to you. Everything that you need to achieve any dream that you have is inside of you. So if you want to achieve anything, you are already made with everything inside of you. If you needed to be taller enough, you would have been taller. If any dream that I want to achieve, I would have had it. So with a, with a leg or without a leg, any dream that I need to achieve, I am made with it. It is inside of me. I just need to develop it and I need to chase it. So um, I think all the answers and everything that you need to achieve your dreams and your destiny and to fulfill the, the, the reason why you are here on earth is inside of you. You have it. You are made with it, whether it's with a disability or without, or whether you are short or mathematically or technology challenged. Um, the dream that you have inside of you, you are enough. You are enough. And we usually feel very broken and we feel like with the disability, I felt in the beginning extremely broken. I felt really discarded and I felt like a broken door with no purpose. And the moment when you step out of it and you realize that you are here as a spiritual being living a human life, that you have everything that you need to fulfill any destiny, you have it inside of you and that you are capable of reaching that. And I think my amputation has really taken me into a very more spiritual depth, I think. And that, connecting that, with people taking me on that path. I hope that, that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And that's, that's a, a completely different angle, I think, to some of the other interviewees that we've had during lockdown. So that, that's fascinating. Just a very quick one on that. Um, was there anybody else within the world of sport or dance um, from a disability background that inspired you or you looked at at that time? Um, I'm going to be honest with you. It was the normal people that inspired me. Um, my beginning of amputation, it was a lot of you. The only, when I had my amputation in 2013, the only people you really knew about with amputation was massive athletes and, you know, people that was doing extremely well with amputation. And there you are struggling <laughs> to take a walk around the block or just going from point A to B without having blisters and your balance are off and it's painful and you're struggling and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm making such a mess of this. So it, it kind of, I'm going to, it, it kind of made me discouraged, but then you meet the normal people, you know, and I think they motivated me a little bit more. So um, I hope that that makes sense, um, that it was the normal people doing the mundane things. I met nurses that was working with amputation. I met people being pregnant, having an amputation. I met normal people being teachers with amputation. And I think I found a lot of, motivation in people doing mundane things, having similar normal issues and problems. Um, I think that motivated me on a different level. Um, <laughs> no, to, to a certain extent, that's very reassuring because I think sometimes we, we rely on people looking at, at role models out in the world of sport or um, entertainment and perhaps um, 
latching on to the in the way that you said normal people might be a more reassuring way to go sometimes so that's really good to hear just got a couple more questions from me um i'm always interested in the difference between um people that ha were born with disabilities and people that have either developed or um encountered those disabilities later in their life have you met people who've had amputation or disability from very early in their life and how do you think that's different to people that have then um, encountered a disability later in life? Um, we, we, I met a little girl last year during an officer campaign that we had, um, a little girl who had non-benign cancer growth in her legs that had to be amputated and she just wanted to play and um, she had an amputation very early. I think children, and I've also met during my author test, you know, going for appointments and stuff, I've met children who is on such an early age on prosthesis, and it's amazing seeing those kids just putting on legs and just going. I think children learn on a very earlier age, and I think because they are so moldable on that age, I think they, I think they adapt very earlier. And I think it's very important that they are on that age very surrounded with such acceptance and love because if they are at that age included in everything and everybody is just accepting them because if i see kids around me the opinion about prosthesis and stuff is so it's so genuine it's just so it's so cool they are so cool about it and i think if children can grow up with friends who's got this disabilities from an early age, it becomes such a normal thing. It doesn't become such a scary thing. So I think children are more acceptable to it and more, they just, kids are, kids are, kids are much kinder about this. And I think later in life, when we start with what is the norm and we get learned, we, we get taught about how things should look and how it should be, and how magazines and everything tells us what the perfect image is and what the perfect body is and that gets mind feed then we start judging ourselves even if you've got the perfect body and you've got the perfect everything we still get mind rolled and i think if it gets from an early age i think it's easier if we if we enforce that as adults for children as well what the norm that there isn't a norm that everybody is perfect on their own as it is. But I think children adapt easier when, they, when they're smaller, like with languages. They learn a language easier when they're smaller. Thank you very much. That leads um, really well into the last question that I've got is that obviously I'm working with um, children and young people every day in school. Um, my role is within health and well-being, so that includes physical, emotional and mental health. Um, what do you think we should be doing in schools to really encourage positive mental health and also positive attitudes towards people with disabilities? Um, as a school nurse, I also work with a lot of kids and I have to honestly tell you, the more easier or the more comfortable I am with myself, the more comfortable kids is around me. Um, it's, like I said, it's usually if you will, I'm gonna use an example now, If if you are in a shop and a parent go, oh, don't look, don't stay, it obviously creates that, don't look, it's not normal. But the moment when you're comfortable, and you're like, come look, you can feel, you know, it's normal, and, you, and they're comfortable, they, it, it's easier. And, and children is the same. Children, like I said, children is inquisitive. The more fun you make it, one of our other, um, ambassadors, actually, his prosthesis is superheroes. And he's actually made it like um, Ahmad Hassan, he's shark boy. He's made it that the socket doesn't have, the superhero doesn't have a head. So he is the head of the superhero on his leg. So children love that. So they are inquisitive. They want to get involved with that. And also like when I'm, I'm the school nurse at my school, children love when they, especially when, when I wear my cosmetic um, leg, they would come and I have this game where they want to guess which of my legs is my 
Barbie doll leg. So <laughs> it becomes such a normal thing. And when they do buy, um, you know, when they do these robotic stuff, they once made a robotic hand and they couldn't wait to come and show me this. And they are, they'll come and ask you how technology work with legs and with prosthesis. So um, a lot of the ambassadors go and speak at schools too and show the kids and get the kids involved and let the kids feel and and it it's it that they are very cool about it. I mean one of my friends little boys actually the other day um, that my, my my leg was in for a little fixture and I was on crutches and he said to me he just sat and he looked at me and he said to me, you know, you know Lucia and I, I really think your Barbie doll legs isn't strong enough. I think you need a Hulk leg. And I said to him, but a, a Hulk leg isn't going to look that pretty on me. And he said, yes, but your Barbie doll legs, they just break too easily. So we had this discussion about, and it was a long discussion, you know, a real debate about whether to have a Hulk leg or a Barbie doll leg. So I think the more it's discussed and the more you include them and the more it is discussed like a normal thing and more the hush hush thing the normal it becomes the moment when you do something quiet and hush hush the more it becomes something that's not okay and the more you include them in normal discussions and make it a normal topic like what color is your hair the more it's accepted that's fantastic. Um, I'll hand back to Andy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Owen. Thanks, Owen. Uh, Larissa, think, thinking about lockdown and thinking about you know how uh, different countries are coping at the moment, I and mean, we were we're coming out of uh, restrictions now and starting to ease a bit more. What's it like at the moment in South Africa? We are in our peak season at the moment. Um, we have been on lockdown since the 27th of March. <clears throat> we started on a very heavy lockdown, on level 5 as we call it. So when we had our first cases and our first death, we, had, we actually went on lockdown on my birthday, the 27th of March, like severe lockdown, everything lockdown, moving nowhere. Um, and we started opening up because of economic reasons because um, a lot of businesses were lost, people were really struggling financially. Um, but at the moment we are in our peak season and unfortunately it's also our winter and flu season as well. So our hospitals are full um, and it's, it's, it's very busy at the moment. We are over 44, 45,000 people sick at the moment. So we are we are, it's, it's, it's not a nice time at the moment in South Africa. And I mean, how, how, you know, thinking of yourself and, and the, you know, being an ambassador for Azor as well, and how, how have you coped with supporting others and yourself in lockdown? How, how has that been for you? Has it been a lot harder? Lockdown is, I think what, what really got to me was you, we can't, it's a, it's a very time that you had to spend alone. And I think for a lot of people that creates a lot of anxiety. And also you can't spend time with family and friends. Like my parents stay in a different province. Um, and my mom had to go for a back operation. I couldn't travel to go and be with them, which makes it, it, it it's hard. Um, so it's a very lonely time. And I think people around you is very anxious. All, most of my friends is nurses and healthcare workers. Um, so the, the anxiety and the fear levels is pretty high at the moment in our country. Um, and I think that we all forget about the massive psycho somatic impact that fear can have on our immune system as well because anxiety and fear can bring up down the immune system as well so when we were in lockdown that first 
month or so, um, I, I, it, it gave me a lot of time to reflect on myself and re-evaluate my choices and what I need to do and where I am in life and on what route I am. And a lot of soul searching time. I also got to sprinkle in my house and found a lot of things I couldn't find in a long time. In South Africa, we cope in different ways with stuff. Like they um, they took away all the alcohol. We had an alcohol and cigarette ban in South Africa as well. So people started making their own booze with pineapple, beer, and funny stuff like that. And we had an egg challenge going around. I don't know if you guys did that in the UK. Uh, we've, we've done sort of different things. And obviously, you know, part of that, for this project, we, we've talked to so many different people. But for us, it was about reconnecting with people to obviously support that motivation. In different ways and fell for doing silly things. Like I said, like I did an egg challenge. So people people felt doing being poor, doing silly things, mm. um, just to lift spirits a little bit. I, I miss dancing quite a lot. I actually broke my bathroom door by accident, dancing with it, for fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, you do things to entertain yourself and keep positive. I did a little bit of writing as well. And I think it's, it was very important to stay in touch. So you, you, you did get a little bit of time to really have a lot of long, deep conversations with people. And um, yes. <laughs> I also write new protocols for the school because the whole health system changes the way we're going to do things because we open on the 12th of August. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, think, thinking about everything you've done and, you know, I mean, you've achieved so much from where you, where you began and where you are now. What's your most uh, fondest memory or moment or achievement? What's, what can you really think that really sticks out at this, and think, yeah, that, that really, you know, was my amazing achievement of, of all time? From my amputation? It, it, totally up to you. Um, you know, it's, it's what really comes to mind, you know, that really your, your, your best achievement or your fondest me memory. Sure, and there's so many. Like I said, there's, there's so many that I am, and I like to say, everything is just grace. Eh? Um, silly things, like I've never ever thought I would walk again. I never ever thought I would walk on a beach again. Um, becoming part of the Oscar team was, is obviously one of my greatest blessings. Um, being able to do small things that I never thought my body would be able to do again, like small dancing steps that I can still do, bending still in funny ways I still can do. Um, for me, like I said, it, I know we have to give um, compliments to ourselves when we achieve something, but for me, it's still everything is still grace. It's still blessings. Um, I do, for me, like I said, this I'm, I'm still very blessed to be here and to do small things that I still can. Like I can still dance, not fully as I could. Um, there's certain things that my body know I can do, but I can't. Um, but I'm I'm happy to still be able to do certain things. And and but during lockdown, I, I I'm very um, I baked an uh, animated cake, <laughs> which I thought I would. I actually, I can show you this. Okay. I folded a protea out of a book. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think that there's, there's many things like that. I did, a, I did a color run, which I never thought I could, a five kilometer fun color run. I never thought I would be able to do that again. Right. That's fantastic. So, there's so many things that I have done, but like I said, it's all grace. It's really all grace and blessings. Um, amazing. 
Fantastic. Um, thinking about obviously motivation, inspiration, and we talk about inclusion and diversity. Um, what to you? What? Why is inclusion and diversity so important? Um, especially now we've locked down and as we we start to come out of uh, restrictions, but also for the future as well. Inclusion is something that is very, very dear and very close to my heart. Um, inclusion is usually a state where you are included in a group or in a structure. And if you go look in, at inclusion in any state, we as humans need to be included in things because it goes down to our primary need of feeling part of something. And it, and it's, it's not what it is something that makes us feel safe and it's something that gives us value to be part of something so and if you look at the opposite thing of inclusion is being excluded and that is usually if you look at school or anyway it's 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 a it's a it's it's being bullied where you exclude someone and it devalues you and when you are excluded even from strangers it it makes you feel unsafe. So it's very important to feel included from anything. Um, it's traumatic not being included in a court. So inclusion is very important uh, for any human being for feeling safe and to feel valued, um, part of a court, part of a group or part of a structure. And why inclusion and diversity is important like i said it gives us value it makes us feel safe as human beings because we were made to we are group animals um it's part of our primary needs and diversity if you look at musical instruments for an example it's lovely listening to just one musical instrument but you can only listen to it as long but if you use a diversity of musical instruments, that's the only way that you are going to get an orchestra. Fantastic. Only a flute or only a piano or only a violin. You can only listen to it that long. It's not that it's pretty, <laughs> but it's to get the value of an orchestra, you need a diversity of musical instruments. Thank you. I mean, you know, I work with Paradance UK um, and you know, we, you talk about uh, being a ballerina and dance. What's your um, favourite kind of dance? And, you know, if, you know, are you are in the future going back to dance or is that something now that's, you know, not in, the, in your plans for the future? I've been a ballerina since I was four years old and I got bored with it. So I started doing acrobatic ballet. So I was more upside down on my hands than I was on my feet. Um, <laughs> my world feels a little bit upside down at the moment, my future a little bit too, so I need to really reevaluate again. Um, <clears throat> because of the massive amounts of operations that we did in order to save my leg, I had to donate lots of bone from my healthy leg, so I donated quite a lot of tibia bone fibula to my other leg. So I can't bounce and hop and do all the stuff on my um, my healthy leg anymore like I used to. Mm. So I need to reserve that ankle very carefully. So there's many reasons why I can't do as much as I used to be doing. But I do push my limits sometimes a little bit. And after right words, I go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I see still some times that I do um, um, dancing for fun with friends and stuff like that. Yes, I do. I still do a lot of poses. But dancing professionally, that is out of the question. But um, I was looking at aerial dancing where they dance on, you know, the strings and in yeah. the air. Um, I actually really just started looking and looking at places where they do it close to home and where it's very easy for me to get to go there after work and then lockdown started. <laughs> so that's <laughs> definitely something I would love to try and see if it will be able to do that with the prosthesis, dancing with ribbons and stuff in the air, aerial dancing. Yeah. 
Um, but with, with walking with prosthesis, I had to work so hard getting my core strong. So I don't know if I'm that flexible in my back anymore, but I'm definitely going to give that a try. Um, after my amputation, I have bounced quite a lot trying new sports. I've done archery. I have done boot camping. I have done water aerobics, water. I've done Zumba. I love Zumba. Um, so I, I stay in because it's when I still try and find my niche as they say to find what what makes me tick um, but I do do Pilates quite a lot um, but I'm definitely going to do the aerial I'm going to definitely try the aerial dancing as, as soon as, as you know everything goes back to normal Fantastic. amazing um, before we finish, we, we, we always finish with two questions um, to do with lockdown. And, you know, we, we talk about um, the people at the moment at home still struggling with anxiety and stress and, you know, lots of different issues. And we talk about the medical staff and the key workers that are, are doing a fantastic job on the front line. What would your message be to all of these people with regards to motivation and inspiration? So, you know, the, the healthy workers, I've actually read a quote with um, Maya Angelou, you know, she's, I mean, that woman speaks, I don't know, she just always makes me cry for some reason, you know, some people just make you cry when they speak, um, but Maya, Maya Angelou said, they may forget your name, but they will never forget the way you make them feel. And that's why I want to say, as a nurse myself and to my friends and to everybody who is a healthcare professional, that it's, it's that uniqueness and your uniqueness and your efficiency that you bring your gifts and your service that you bring to people is your gift to this world. And it's only you that can offer this to this planet and to this people. And it's your service and your kindness. And this, what you do is, they, they might forget your name. And people, people always, people don't want to be forgotten. But what you do will never be forgotten by your patients, what you do for them. And that will be unforgettable. It's unforgettable what you do daily. And I also want to say that you must remember the law of motion, that when you do the right thing, it will come back to you. It does always come back to you because people... And, and, and remember, people notice um, what you do. People notice the kindness and the acts that you do. And that is what's going to make you unforgettable. And I also, for me, I don't know how religious you are, but it helps to know that there is something greater than just you that is in charge something a spirit a god but there is something greater than you and it's not just you alone that something greater is in charge and <clears throat> we always go on a belief system that we need to be strong don't be strong just be brave when you're brave you can have moments of feeling sad and broken down i had the other day i had a very not a not a not a good moment and I could just sit in my car and cry. And you can still have those moments and be brave. So don't be strong. Strong means to be you ha you can't have weak moments. Have moments and acknowledge those moments when you have moments of sadness or feeling powerless and embrace them. And then look after yourself like you do your patients. Because you need to Fill your cup before you can give it out again. And remember, the people will not forget how you made them feel. 
and that is what's going to make you unforgettable and stay brave. Lisa Van Halden, it's it's a pleasure. I mean, I was going to add my last question was to be, um, what's your favourite quote? But I think you've you've summed up everything there in the first place. Um, a pleasure to meet you, Owen. Thank you so much, Louisa Van ha Van he Heden. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe. And take thank care. you. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you, Owen. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, -bye. Take care. Bye.